First of all, let's talk a little bit about the fish. As I mentioned earlier, this is one mean, badass fish right there, okay? That thing will hunt down at 2,000 feet right on the bottom during the day. They're sensitive to light. They've got these huge eyes, as you can see, and these big pupils, and they don't like light. At nighttime, the swordfish will rise toward the surface. That's why in the past, everybody went out at night and they set their baits up on the surface, and that's a whole other seminar, because that takes hours to talk about that whole night setup. But those swordfish will come up toward the surface. During the day, as that sun comes up in the morning, that fish is going down. He's going down, 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 down. Now keep in mind, the temperature differences up toward the surface, that water might be 80 degrees. Down on the bottom, 2,000 feet down, it's pitch black and it might be 40 degrees. That's a huge difference. That fish can survive and thrive in that environment because it's equipped with really special, I guess the easiest way to say it, with a heat exchanger, almost like a radiator. And it sends warm blood to its eyes and to its vital organs that allow that fish to thrive in the pitch black icy depths. I mean, think about just for a second, the environment that that guy lives in. 2,000 feet down, pitch black, ice cold, Gulf Stream currents, the water's raging, and this guy's down there making babies and eating. That's what they do. They make babies and they eat. And fortunately, here, off of our coast, we are in the swordfish capital of the world. There is no place on the globe, no place where you have as good of a chance at catching a swordfish as right here right out front here, okay? And we're gonna talk about the different locations in a second. So we're really fortunate, you know, South Florida here, we've got great sail fishing, we've got great inshore fishing, all kinds of really good stuff. But the sword fishing is exceptional. And as I mentioned earlier, back in the day, guys would go out and they'd fish at night, and they still do. There's a lot of guys that go out there at night and set the spread and they drift in the Gulf Stream. And then, I don't know, we'll say 15, 20 years ago, somebody got the bright idea and said, you know, why are we out here losing sleep at night? Why don't we do this during the day? But the problem was they couldn't years and years ago because the tackle and the technology wasn't up to par, okay? And then a really magical thing happened and somebody introduced braid, braided line. That changed the game forever changed the game of fishing across the board, and it changed the game for daytime sword fishing. Because now with ultra thin braid, which is super, super thin, you're able to present baits in really deep water that you couldn't have in the past, okay? So it's a combination of techniques that have evolved, technology that has evolved, not only in rods and reels, but certainly in that line, I can't stress that enough, in that braided line, that allows us to now go out there during the day and target these things during the day and never have to lose any sleep. But there's a lot of differences between daytime sword fishing and nighttime sword fishing. Daytime, we are usually fishing one rod. One rod, one line, one bait. The fishery has evolved to now include two rods. And sometimes you can fish a buoy rod off the stern of the boat. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that, but that's really for the top echelon of daytime swordfish anglers. By show of hands, who's caught a swordfish? Okay, so none of you guys, okay, good, good, decent percentage, but most of you guys haven't yet, so you really want to stick with the single rod for now. As you advance, your tackle advances, your experience advances, you can get into the two rod spread, but for now it's all about one rod. Before we go any further, I just want to mention something really quick too. A lot of people believe because we're using electric reels, I've heard over from different people that this is commercial fishing because you're using an electric reel. Is this commercial fishing? Okay, absolutely not. Hi, Leah. Everybody say hi to Leah, my wife. Okay. Hold, there's your giveaways. Okay. You can give away some who rags here. Okay, there you go. Okay. So again, this is not commercial fishing. Commercial fishing is a commercial boat that's out there. The guy's setting the long line that has dozens, if not hundreds, of hooks. That's not what we're doing. This is sport, okay? It's sport. However, it takes a tremendous amount of, of effort to do what we do during the day 
to where you need this sort of equipment. You have to have the electric reels. Why? Because we have something out front here that they don't have in a lot of other places and a, a lot of other places in the world, and that's called current. Everybody knows the Gulf Stream current is raging. Anybody know how fast the Gulf Stream current is? Okay, yeah. three to five knots on average, and sometimes even more than that. So we have a lot of current that we're dealing with. And when you're dealing with deep water, 2,000 feet deep, and you're fishing a lot of lead, 10 pounds, okay, you are not cranking this sucker, okay? You can one time, but you're not doing that all day long, are you? You're not. So you've got to have some power assist equipment. And there's some options out there, you know? There's reels we're going to talk about that come with a motor that you can remove off the reel. There's reels that still have a crank if you do want to, you know, be a little bit more sporty. And, and we'll talk about the evolution of all of that down the line. But make no mistake, this is not commercial fishing. This is sport fishing. It's recreational fishing, and it takes a tremendous amount of effort to be successful in this fishery, more so than any other fishery that I know. As I mentioned earlier, this is about the details, the details. And this fish right here will exploit any weak link that you have. Even when everything is perfect, you'll still lose fish. Okay, when everything is perfect, you'll still lose fish. And if something is flawed, if one of your connections is flawed, if your drag is too tight, if your knot is not 100% bulletproof, you will lose every single time. And it will be an extremely frustrating experience. So you've got to pay attention to the details, especially when setting the bait. And we're going to talk a lot about that as well. Because when you're setting your bait, it's very easy for that bait to get tangled. And if it gets tangled, guess what's happening? You're not catching, you're, this is what you're catching, nothing, absolutely zero. And unfortunately, you don't even know that, you're, that your rig is tangled because it's 2,000 feet away from the boat. So you don't even know that it's tangled. Okay, so first let's talk about where to swordfish. As I mentioned, right out here, we've got the Gulf Stream current. We've got the continental shelf. There are ledges, there are hills, there are ridges. When you look out here, the water looks flat. Do you think it's flat below the surface? Of course not. It almost looks like the Grand Canyon out there. Not quite as, as extreme, but once you get way offshore past that thousand foot mark, it drops dramatically. And there's all sorts of under, underwater hills and depressions. That's where those swordfish are because as that current rages along those bottom depressions or those bottom structures, it creates upwellings, it pushes bait, okay, and there's all sorts of bait down there. You may not, you know, when we think of bait, we think of goggle eyes and pilchards and ballyhoo. 2,000 feet down below the surface, there's huge pods of squid, which is a primary staple of the swordfish. There are mackerel, lots of mackerel, okay, that they eat. There's all sorts of different types of prey, eels, all sorts of stuff. And you know, anybody ever catch a swordfish where the bill was all jagged and kind of beat up on the sides? That anybody ever see that? It's believed because that fish will dig in the bottom with its bill to dig out eels and prey out of the bottom. That's how savage they are. Okay, it'll, they'll literally sniff the bait out of the bottom so their bills get all jagged. So there's all kinds of stuff for them to eat out there. So from our area here, right, out, right outside Hillsboro Inlet, there's something I want to show you on my chart platter here. This is off my Furuno TZ Touch, okay? And I'm going to stop for a second. And you can kind of see that's the coast of Florida. There's Lake Okeechobee there. And there's our coast right there. All of the red spots are, you know, some of my spots closer to shore. You see the yellow spots. That's some of my deep drop spots. No, I'm not giving you all the GPS numbers. And then you see the purple spots, and those are swordfish numbers, okay? And I'm going to go to the next frame that kind of just zooms in on it a little bit. And you can see I tried to kind of do it in a 3D fashion to help you understand this a little bit better. And we'll go to the next frame there, okay? And you can see, there we go, those sharp lines, okay? That's a sharp cliff that just falls off right there. And where are all of those swordfish? They're right on that deeper side of that sharp cliff right there. 
there's hills, there's depressions, but you can see that we've got to be over the cliff. We have to be on the outside of it in that deeper water where it's anywhere from 1,400 to 1,800 feet. On the far side there to the right, it'll drop to as deep as 2,000 feet, and it'll keep dropping. 90% of the daytime sword fishing that we're doing out here is anywhere from about 1,600 to 2,000. That's the depth, 1,600 to 2,000. 1,650, 17, 18, you know, different spots are going to have different depths, obviously, if you're over top of a hill or if there's a depression under the boat. And I'm going to kind of just zoom in a little bit more, go to the next frame. Okay, and I'm going to stop there for a second. So you can have, again, hopefully you can kind of envision that, that cliff right there and all of those swordfish spots being right on the east side of the cliff right there. So that's where they're at. At nighttime, they come up this way. They'll come up. Okay, and at nighttime, you can fish for them from around 1,100 to 1,500 feet up toward the surface. But during the day, they all swim back down into the deeper water. So that's where they're at during the day. There's no magic X marks the spot, even though those are some good X marks the spots. There's no magic X marks the spot because you're drifting. You're not going out there and fishing directly over top of a wreck and saying, I'm going to catch one right here. You're not. Those fish are moving. These fish have big tails. They're powerful. They're constantly swimming down there looking for food, making babies. It's a nursery out here, too. That's one of the reasons our sword fishing is so good, because the, the habitat is perfect to make babies. Okay? And during the day, they're down there just eating. It's, it's crazy. And they don't always eat. They're not always there. But when they are, it certainly could be very exciting. These are the same fish that swim all the way up the coast, all the way up to New England. They follow this path. They follow these contours all the way up off the Carolinas, then ultimately off New Jersey, off you know New England up there, and then they'll migrate and come all the way back down. They're the same fish also that are down in the Keys. So they swim all up and down. Now keep in mind, what holds them in a particular area for any length of time is forage, is a food supply. So if there's a lot of food in one particular area, they're going to hang out for a while because there's no reason for them to go anywhere. Does that make sense? Okay, so sometimes you'll see that the bite could be really hot right out here for a week or two, and then it completely fizzles out. That could mean because the bait moved out, and in turn, so did the swordfish. And one thing real quick on bait, anybody ever hear the term a pumpkin swordfish? Okay, sometimes you'll catch a swordfish and the meat will not be white, but it'll almost be the color of this tackle box right here, literally like a pumpkin. It's believed that that fish has been feeding heavily on red shrimp, shrimp. So imagine a fish, not only this size, but three or four times that size eating shrimp. Hard to believe, but it's food and they'll eat it. They'll eat whatever is available to them. And they definitely like that shrimp. It's kind of like flamingos. Flamingos are pink because they eat all of those shrimp. Same thing, but you don't know it's a pumpkin swordfish until you cut it open. There's absolutely no evidence on the outside that indicates that that's a pumpkin, okay? So that's where we're fishing, right there. Right out here, it's about 20 miles. Usually what we will do is run to the south because we are constantly drifting north. So we may run and start our drift down off Miami. We may start off Hollywood. And as the day progresses, we're drifting north and north. And meet. ultimately, we may end up off Boca, okay, or certainly off of Pompano. So your ride in the morning may be 22 to 25 miles because you're not heading due east, you're actually going southeast. But at the end of the day, when it's time to come back home, assuming Hillsborough Inlet is your home, or Boca Inlet, your ride may only be 17 or 18 miles because you're right off the beach here. And sometimes they'll even bite better up here to the north versus down to the south. So it's nice to, you know, of course, cover that whole area. But like I said, it's only, give or take, 20 miles, and that's not that far. Guys are running 50, 60, 70 miles to the Bahamas, if not more, to run out 20 miles to have a chance to catch that fish or its mother, okay, 
isn't that big of a deal. It really isn't. So we're super, super fortunate to have this fishery right at our front door here. So that's where we're fishing, right out here. When? Every day, baby. Every day. 365 days a year, there's not a single day that you can't go out here and catch a swordfish. It's all about the weather, weather permitting. Obviously, it's going to blow 25 to 35 over the next couple days. Don't go daytime sword fishing. Okay? I don't need to tell you that. However, if the conditions permit, go. Okay? Go, because there's no, there's no season. They're here. Usually, the pattern is in the wintertime, you'll tend to see bigger fish. But, you know, the one thing we know for sure about fishing, the only guarantee is that there are no guarantees. So you could hook a 500-pounder in the middle of the summer when typically you would catch those bigger females. All of the big, giant swordfish over 300 pounds are all females, every single one of them, okay? And you can catch one in the middle of the winter. And that's, again, really important. You need to remember, every single bait that you are dropping to the bottom could result in a fish that is 50 to 500 pounds. You cannot determine what size fish eats your bait. I wish I could determine that, but you can't, okay? All you can do is go out there, prepare as best as you can, and fish for that fish knowing that at any time, that bite that you get may be a 50, maybe a 500 pounder. Wouldn't that be something? Okay, a fi anybody catch a 500? We call those a nickel. Anybody catch a 500 pounder? I haven't yet, hope to one day, okay? That's a monster fish, but they're out here. Every year, numerous 500 pounders are caught right out front here, and some fish even bigger, okay? So keep that in mind, and you've gotta be rigged for that because you put in all this time, all this effort, all this money, and you go out there and you hook this giant fish, and you're not prepared for that. I don't, you know, you need to really think about what it's like when a 500 pound swordfish comes up to the boat after you have fought that fish for upwards of five to seven hours and suddenly you see this horse, okay, this dinosaur, this monster that's 12 feet long and has a six foot sword sticking out of its nose and it's pissed. It's really, really mad. It's not dead, it's mad, okay? It's really mad that you ruined its day and it's now approaching the boat. If you think you're gonna grab your little hand gaff and go, I got it, I'll grab it, I'll gaff them. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, no, you're not. You better just stop and think about what the heck is happening here. And you have to prepare for that. You know, when you go out, when we go out sword fishing, I can't tell you how many gaffs I have on the boat, how many flying gaffs, harpoons, and we're, we're gonna show you those you know, in a few minutes because I'm always praying and hoping, knowing that that next fish may be 500 pounds. And I don't wanna be that guy who fights that fish for five hours, and then it comes up next to the boat, and I don't have the gear to subdue that fish. Okay, and, and I'm standing there going, what do we do? Okay, and trembling. Okay, I don't wanna be that guy. So you really have to be prepared. Not only in your tackle, like we talked about earlier, but sword fishing is so much more. You need all of these other accessories. You need the harpoons. You need the flying gaffs. You need the tail ropes. You need the gloves. You need all kinds of stuff. And if you don't have all of that and backups for everything, don't go. Don't go because you're just wasting your time. Okay, you really are. Not saying you can't get lucky because you know what? Even a blind squirrel finds a nut every now and then. But that's not, con that's not consistent success, okay? So you really have to be well, well prepared. Your boat, the safety equipment, this goes without saying. I don't need to tell you this. All your safety equipment, you're gonna be out in the Gulf Stream. And remember this, fuel. You may get into the battle of your life. You may go run 25 miles down off Miami, drop a bait to the bottom, maybe fish all day, never have a bite, and your last drop you hook a behemoth, you hook mama, okay? And you fight that baby for five hours, suddenly it's dark. You're into nighttime, okay? And you've drifted potentially 20 miles, 25 miles while you are fighting this monster fish. And now you're completely exhausted. You've got this trophy laying in your boat if you're even lucky enough to get them in the boat. And now you gotta run home. So you have to, you have to prepare for all of that. This is no joke. This is not little, I'm gonna go here, go king fishing. No, 
Okay, this is the real deal right here, the real McCoy. Okay, I'm serious. You never know what could happen out there. Not only with the swordfish, you know what else guys catch out here? Giant sharks. Okay, not that they're targeting, but you'll catch big sharks. How about giant bluefin tuna? Okay, there, I can't tell you how many giant bluefin tuna have been caught on sword baits. Big eye tuna, blue marlin, all sorts of stuff. Oil fish, okay, uh, lancet fish. There's all kinds of weird stuff out there. But of course, the target is that guy right there. But you really have to take it seriously. This is no joke, and it could be really dangerous because, again, he'll try and kill you. He will try and kill you, and he can kill you. Okay, I can't tell you how many guys have ended up in the hospital from being hit by swordfish bills. Okay? A lot. My camera guy almost got smashed in the head with, you know, a swordfish bill. So you really have to be careful. You really do. So now, here it is, the day we want to go sword fishing. We're well prepared. Our boat, you know, we've got plenty of fuel. We've got all our safety gear. We've taken all that into consideration. We know where we're going. Okay, we, our boat is rigged properly for daytime sword fishing. We've got 12 volt outlets. This is not the kind of place where you're gonna bring a car battery and take the wires from the end of your reel and kind of just wrap them around some alligator clips or some wing nuts. Not gonna happen, okay? Could you get away with it? Yes, but that's not the right way to do this. And again, when the potential is there to hook a 500 pound monster, why go if you're not going to, to do it, to do it right? So make sure that your boat's properly prepared. Something as simple as the gauge of the wire, okay? The gauge of the wire going from your power to your 12 volt outlet. If the gauge of that wire is not heavy enough, your reel will fail under load. So the reel will work perfect, you think, and then you hook a 300 pound swordfish, you go to engage the reel and the reel goes eh, and now what do you do? You've got 2,500 feet of line out. You've got a 300 pound fish on the other end of the line and you got no power. You don't even have a handle. What are you gonna do? Okay, you're gonna really be in a world of trouble right there. Trust me, you're gonna sit there and try and hand line. Okay, 2,500 fe you know, 20, feet of braid by hand. You'll have no other choice other than to just cut it and go home and certainly you don't wanna do that. So make sure that you're ready to do this. Your rod holders, tremendous, tremendous amount of strain on this rod in the rod holder when you are sword fishing. Tremendous amount of strain. If your rod holder is not through bolted and has a backing plate, you risk breaking your boat. I'm not saying you're gonna rip the entire side of your boat off, but certainly you can damage your boat and rip a rod holder right out. So again, you've got to make sure that you're ready, you know, for everything and that your boat's properly prepared. So here it is the morning of, you know, again, we're ready to go. I want to now real quick get into tackle, okay, and get into the proper tackle here. Remember that we are dropping baits in water that could be 2,000 feet deep, usually 16, 17, 1800, but certainly up to 2,000 feet deep. We need plenty of line capacity because remember when we drop that bait, it is not 2,000 feet straight down. It is, whew, there's a giant bow in the line. It looks like your line is coming right off the rod tip and it looks like it's going straight down. And you would think if you were naive that your bait was 2,000 feet down right there and it is nowhere near your bow. There's a giant bow in that line, a giant bow. So you need plenty of line capacity. This is a 3,000 yard spool, 9,000 feet of line, okay, on this spool. And the spools are interchangeable, by the way. So you can pop this spool off and put a different spool on, on this particular reel. This is a Lingren Pittman S1200, okay? It is the Mac Daddy of swordfish reels. It does not have a handle. It does not have any sort of fancy anything. This is a monster reel desi designed to reel in monster fish. There are other options out there, okay? There are. There's Hooker Electric evolving. They've been around for a number of years. You know, they're becoming more and more popular, and I'm sure that down the line, they're going to continue to become more popular. That is the type of unit where it's a motor that attaches to your reel, your existing reel, 
per se a 50 wide or an 80 wide. You can attach it right to the side of your reel. You still have full functionality of the reel or you can flick a switch and turn a knob and now you have power. They're super, super fast, okay? It's probably twice as fast as this particular reel, which I believe is the best benefit to that hooker electric. Or, as I mentioned earlier, you can literally pop that motor right off and crank if you wanted to. You don't want to, but if you wanted to, you could crank, okay? Again, that's one option that's out there. There's some other really good quality electric reels. Um, you know, Crystal Fishing makes a good electric reel. The Daiwa has a big MP3000, which, eh, eh, okay, not for this, it's slow, okay? It's a great big deep drop reel, but it's slow, and you want something with speed, because remember that you are retrieving this bait. You're not going out there and dropping one bait to the bottom, and that's it, one and done. You may do 10 drops in a day maybe even more depending on conditions and how things are going. You may do 10 drops. When you have 2,500 revolutions of line out and you want to check your bait, the process alone of just bringing that bait in, checking the bait and resetting the bait is no less than a 30 to 45 minute process, okay, from beginning to end. So you just blew at least a half hour. If you have a slow reel that's going e it'll drive you crazy. It'll literally take you almost a half hour to, bring, to retrieve that line. This Linger and Pittman S1200 is the perfect combination of everything. It's the right amount of speed. It has plenty of torque, plenty of line capacity, plenty of drag. Most importantly, and the reason that I really like it, everything is big. It's got big buttons. It's got a big screen. It's got a big lever, a big drag dial. You know, it's very easy to work this reel. It's very easy to see exactly what you're doing, how much line you have out. For guys like me that wear glasses, you know what? If the screen is this big and I'm standing back here, I can't even see what's on that screen. With that big screen, no matter where you are, you can tell exactly how much line you have out. That's a big, big benefit. Like I said, real big buttons, easy to control this reel. It's the Mac Daddy right here. The rod, this is a Chaos Rodzilla rated for 60 to 130 pound line. You need a beefy rod. Remember, the fish that we're gonna catch could be 500 pounds. You need something that's got plenty of backbone. However, you also need a soft tip. You really need a soft tip. That's really, really important. You don't want it to be too soft, but you gotta be able to see that. You have to be able to see that in the rod tip, okay? To see that rod tip moving. If that was really, really stiff, you wouldn't have the action, you wouldn't have the play that you're looking for. So certainly, a lot of variations in sword rods, you know, everybody has their own way of doing things, all the experienced guys, and understand, please, I'm not trying to sit up here and tell you that my way is the best way. I'm not trying to tell you that the way that I do things is the way that you should do them. I'm simply sharing my knowledge and my experience with you, you know, over the years and from learning everything that we have through the magazine, through the television show. But if something is working for you, particular tackles working for you, stick with it. Tell me about it because I want to know about it too. But if you're going to go out there and get geared up and if you want to do it the right way, this is it right here okay get a rodzilla from marshall before you leave here order one of these rods they'll be happy to make one for you okay he'll also sell you the reel as far as the line is concerned like i said earlier braid it's all about the braid pound test when guys started deep dropping for swordfish during the day they started with 130 pound braid and then they said you know what why am i fishing line that's so heavy Okay, why am I fishing line that's so heavy? I can go lighter. And then they went from 130 pound down to 100 pound, down to 80 pound, down to 70 pound. Now there are guys that are daytime sword fishing with 50 pound test. 50 pound test, which to me is way too light. The right pound test, what I find to be the perfect balance is 80 pound. 80 pound braid to me is the perfect balance. Plenty of strength, but it's still super thin. 
I wouldn't recommend, if you're just getting started, I wouldn't recommend anything lighter than 80 pounds. If you're really experienced, like I said, some guys are going down to 65, even 50 pound test. Now you may say to yourself, and you may wonder, how in the world are you catching and reeling in a 500 pound fish, potentially, with ultra thin 80 pound braid? And I'm gonna to explain to you how all of that comes together during the fight, okay? During the fight of the fish. So, our braid itself does not go all the way to the bait, okay? On top of our braid, we have a very long wind-on leader. At the end of the braid, we have doubled the line with a bimini twist. So we have a loop at the end of the braid. Connected to that loop at the end of the braid is a long wind-on leader, 150 feet long. 150 feet long, 250-pound test monofilament. That's what the top shot is. That's what this is called, a top shot. So again, we have tremendous line capacity on the reel of the 80 pound test braid. Then that's connected to a 150 foot long, 250 pound test wind on leader. That wind on leader is everything. That is what is going to make or break you landing that fish. And we'll talk more about that in a second. So this is the tackle that we've chosen to use on our day of sword fishing. We know where we're going, our boat's ready, everything's good. Now we've got our rod and reel together, everybody with me so far? Okay, and we're going to kill a swordfish. We're rigged up, the next thing that we need to do is make sure that we've got the right baits. Okay, we need to make sure that we have the right baits and this is really, really important. We are targeting this guy 2,000 feet below the surface. He will eat almost anything. He'll eat almost anything if he's hungry, okay? He's a monster, he's a savage killer. He knows it's a fish eat fish world down there. If an opportunity presents itself, he's gonna kill it. He's gonna catch it, he's gonna attack it, he's gonna kill it. If it's a shrimp, if it's a squid, if it's a fish of some type, an eel, anything. Anything he can catch and kill and eat. However, the problem lies with us as anglers presenting our bait. It's really challenging to present a bait properly at that depth. So we have to make sure that our baits are very, very streamlined. So there's a variety of different baits right there. On the bottom, you will see as an eel. The one above it right here is a snakehead belly. Everybody familiar with those crazy snakeheads? They make great swordfish baits, great swordfish baits. The one above that is a bonita strip. The one above that is a dolphin belly, and the one all the way up on the top is another bonita strip. Now there's something that all of those baits have in common. They're very streamlined, okay? They're eel-like, eel-like. So this way when we are dropping that bait, you don't want that bait to spin because remember you've got a 150 foot wind-on leader. In between your sinker, and we're gonna talk about how you attach the sinker, in between your sinker and where that bait is is 150 feet. If that 150 foot leader starts doing this, what's gonna happen, okay? Nightmare. It's gonna wrap up all in the line and you know the worst part about it is you don't even know what happened. You have no idea that that just happened on the way down. There's no indication of it. And you could be drifting for three hours going, why am I not getting a bite? That's because you're in one big tangled mess down there and you don't even know it. So to reduce that, all of our baits are very, very streamlined. And I brought a few of them here just to kind of really show you. How about that eel right there? Sorry, Marshall, the place is gonna stink like eel. Okay, you can see really eel-like. There's another one right here, which is just a belly bait right there. You can see they all have a little skirt right on top of it. Okay, and they are stitched properly. And I have to stress this. Rigging swordfish baits is an art. It's an art. It's really, really important that that bait is rigged properly because this fish will often come up to that bait and you know what he's gonna do with it? He's gonna whack it with his bill. Nine out of 10 times, he'll whack it with his bill. And if the bait is not properly attached to the rig and it is not sewed, and you can see the thread, see all the red thread right there? Every one of those baits is sewed onto the hook with rigging floss. Okay, it is rigged properly and professionally on an 11-0 hook, okay? 
that bait has to stay on that hook. It has to withstand an attack from this guy right here. And it has to withstand an attack from squid, because squid will attack those baits and try and eat them as well. So you've got to make sure that your bait is really done properly and sewed onto the hook effectively. The little skirt in front of the bait just prevents that bait from washing out. It helps it swim through the water. Because remember, you're moving. You're moving at three or four miles an hour and that bait is swimming. It really looks alive. So that little skirt gives it a little bit more body, a little bit more profile, okay? A little bit more color. Some of them are glow, some of them are flash. And it prevents the bait from washing out. And I highly recommend, if you are not a professional bait rigger, and if you don't have all of the tools, crimps and crimping tools, and an ice pick, you know, for, to punch holes in the bait to do it properly, don't do it. Don't do it. Buy your baits rigged. There's some guys around here, you know, give credit where credit's due, right around the corner, R.J. Boyle. I'm sure you guys have heard the name Boyle. The guy has swordfish blood running through his veins, okay? He's, his baits that he rigs are second to none. You couldn't rig a swordfish bait better yourself if you tried. You couldn't. So if you're going to put in all of this time and money and effort, Come here to Chaos, they sell rigged swordfish baits, wherever it is, spend the money and buy rigged baits, okay? Because it's so important that that bait is correct. They could be ladyfish, like I said, eels, lots of different options. Some days they seem to have a preference, but it's more about presentation. It's more about making sure that that bait is streamlined and that it's swimming properly and that it's attached to that hook. Because keep in mind, this guy, he'll see a bait out in the distance and he will charge that bait with full force. He's not just gonna swim up to him and go, hey, what's going on? He's charging that bait with full force, okay? And he'll come right up to it and stop, stop. He'll come right up to it and stop. And oftentimes, on your rod, your rod's going to be going like this, and it'll go doop. And what that is, is the pressure wave of a big swordfish rushing up to the bait and stopping. And the pressure wave of him pushing that bait away, you'll often see that bite. He'll stop and he'll see how the bait reacts, because he knows that if he approaches a fish, and if the fish just lays there and goes, eat me, something's wrong, right? That bait has to swim away. Okay, has to swim away naturally and react naturally. So it's so important that your baits are rigged properly. And baits will last a long time. You can go out here, believe it or not, you can go daytime sword fishing with three baits. It's not like you need 20 baits. Two, three, four, five, six at the very most, that's plenty of baits. Okay, you don't need a lot of baits to go out there. Once you get really good at it, if you can rig your own baits, nothing beats fresh. No question, nothing beats a fresh bait. I don't care in what scenario you're fishing, if you can catch a dolphin while you're out there and rip that belly off and sit there and stitch a bait and drop down a fresh dolphin belly, bingo. Who wouldn't want to do that? But if you don't have those skills and if you don't have the right tools to be a professional bait rigger, don't pretend, don't do it. Buy your baits rigged and ready to go, okay? So we've got our variety of baits right there. I like to bring a variety, okay? Some days it just seems like something works better than, you know, something else. But you don't know. You can drop a rigged squid down. You can drop a rigged eel down. You get a bite and catch a fish, and suddenly they were chewing on eels that day. Well, how do you know they weren't going to eat a dolphin belly? You didn't have that down there. So, you know, you just really never know. The bait itself is rigged on 6 to 10 feet of 300-pound monofilament. Six to 10 feet of 300 pound monofilament. On the end of the rig, that is where we crimp it and we do not use snap swivels. Remember what I said to you earlier, it's all in the details. And we've learned mistakes the hard way. Snap swivels fail, they open. I don't care how good of a snap swivel it is, there have been occasions where a snap swivel will fail, it will open or the line will get wrapped around the snap and create a tangle. So we don't do it that way. We don't use snaps. At the end of our wind-on leader, we simply have crimped on a 300-pound Diamond Fishing Products ball bearing swivel, just a swivel. There's no snap on that swivel. And at the end of our bait rig, 
There is no snap or loop. We will take the end of the bait rig right there as we're ready to use it and crimp it right to the, right to the opposite side of the barrel swivel. Now nothing is breaking, nothing can fail. It's very streamlined, it's very strong, and you don't have to worry about anything failing. If you want to change your bait, snip, goodbye with that bait, grab another bait, grab a crimp, and crimp on another bait. Everybody follow me there? Avoid the snaps. That one snap swivel could put an end to your fish, okay? Either by a tangle or will fail as you're fighting that fish. So that is the end of our rig. You could also see we have a little piece of chafing gear right there. And keep in mind, don't be afraid to crimp. You know, 250 pound test mono, you're not tying this in a knot. You can, but you don't want to do that. You want to crimp it. Crimping, a lot of people are scared. They're like, oh, I don't know how to crimp. What are you talking about? You buy a pair of crimpers. They have numbers on the side right here, okay, right on the teeth right there. You buy crimps, coordinating numbers. You put it on the line. You squeeze it as tight as you can. Game over. You have a crimp, and it will never fail. It's, it's stronger than the line practically. So make sure that your connections are really, really strong. So we've taken our bait, okay, We've attached it because we're almost to where we want to fish. So I'll turn around and I'll say to whoever, hey, man, get a bait ready to go. They'll grab one of the baits out. They'll crimp it right to the end of this barrel swivel. They'll lay it on the deck. And now we are ready to deploy that bait. So we will approach the area that we want to fish. And I've decided that I want to fish right here. X marks the spot. I want to make sure that there's this hill, there's this depression, there's something, some feature, and I want to make sure that I am drifting my bait over that feature. If I stop right on top of that hill or depression, or we'll call it X marks the spot, if I stop right there, where's my bait going to be? Way away from it. I'm not going to be anywhere near it. So I have to take that into consideration and I have to say, you know what? I'm going to run one mile south. I'm going to run exactly one mile south of where I want to fish my bait. One mile to the south. So once I get one mile to the south, it is now time to deploy that bait. And this is one of the most, if not the most important thing that you can learn in this entire seminar is how to set a daytime swordfish bait without it getting tangled. Now remember, we are fishing the Gulf Stream current. The current is moving from south to north. Everybody with me there? We're setting the picture here. The current's moving from south to north. I want to fish right here, this spot. So I'm going to run my boat that way, a mile to the south. And I'm then going to get on the rod, and I'm going to kind of show you a video of setting the bait, and I'm going to walk you through it step by step. Here I am. I'm in the back of the boat here, OK? But I want to point something out. At this stage, I will turn around and I will say to my wheelman, whoever is on the wheel, I will say, turn the boat to the north. Turn the boat to the north. So we are down there, and the boat's facing this way. We are going with the current. Even though the current is going three to five miles an hour to the north, we are going with the current. He has turned the boat to the north. I'm now in the back of the boat, and I start to let out my bait. Okay, I'm letting it out. I'm pulling it off the rod tip right here. I've got my lights, and I'm going to stop for one second and talk to you about the lights. So you will see on the end of my leader okay, are three lights, three little strobe lights. These are water activated. As soon as they touch the water, okay, they start to blink. Now our bait, we know, is 6 to 12 feet away from this point, right? I'm not losing everybody, you're with me? Our bait's 6 to 12 feet away. I put this behind the boat, and I start pulling the line off nice and easy until I'm about, I don't know, we'll say 15 to 20 feet away from the bait. And I will take one of my lights, which is already, there's little loops right on the top of these strobes. My leader, as you can see, goes through those loops. So you can see all three of these strobes are on the leader, right there, sliding on the leader. But obviously, we need to affix them into position. So once I'm about 15 to 20 feet away from the bait, I'll take a little black rigging band and just wrap it right around the line few times, okay, you don't have to go crazy with it, and then you can grab your, li your light, okay. 
and just take the light and go in and out of the rigging band. Okay, and what you're trying to do is just to fix this light into position right there. So now it can't slide. Okay, it's right there on the leader and it cannot slide. But the reason we use the rigging bands is because once I re retrieve this and once I reel it up, you know what's going to happen to this? It's going to break. It could break right at the rod tip or you can just grab it and it'll break. And all three lights will slide down the leader. So I will stagger three lights. I'll put one light that's approximately, we'll say 20 feet away from the bait, then another 10 feet away from the bait or I should say another 10 feet away from that light, I'll put a second one. 10 feet away from that light, I'll put a third one. Now essentially what I'm doing is I'm chumming, but I'm using electric chum. I'm using a modern form of chum. I have three blinking lights, three strobes, staggered from about 20 to 40 feet away from the bait. Three different strobes, and they're going like this. They're just different colors, and they're doo -doo 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 -doo. And guess what this guy sees from way out in the distance? Because he could see great, even in that pitch black. Way out in the distance, way out there, he can't see my bait. But if he looks way out there and he sees doo -doo 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 -doo, all these blinking lights, where is he going? He's going toward the light because that mimics squid. It mimics squid flashing below the surface. So it's really just electric chum. Okay, then he'll go out there, the lights will attract him, and guess what's swimming 20 feet away from the lights? My bait, okay? So obviously, really, really important to fish those lights. And that's what you see me doing right there, is I have the lights on the line, and I'm affixing them onto the line with the rigging bands. Did I lose anybody there? You guys all with me on that? So you don't have to use Three, I like to use three. Some guys use one, some guys use two. Completely up to you. As far as colors, these are available in a rainbow of colors. White, green, blue, what we call disco, you know, all sorts of different colors. I mix them up. I don't like red because red dissipates really quick below the surface. So I like natural colors. I like green, you know, everything flashes green, that phosphorescence kind of color. Green, white, blue, purple, the multicolored lights. I mix them up, okay? So there's no real science between the lights. So again, here I am. I'm now letting that bait out behind the boat. I'm affixing my lights, just like I just mentioned to you. There's another one, boom. I'm wrapping it around. And right now, Carlos is on the wheel, my, my partner, and we're sliding to the north. He's keeping the boat moving to the north and I'm slowly feeding the line out behind the boat. I'm slowly, here goes my wind-on leader. I'm still on that 150 pound test wind-on. You can see, okay, I'm still winding, boom. That's where the wind-on right there, that black Dacron is where that wind-on leader connects to the bimini twist in the end of my braid. Okay, everybody with me? That's where that wind-on connects to the end of my braid. Now, right there on that end of that wind-on is a loop. And on that loop, right on my line, is where I attach my sinker. 10-pound lead. Sometimes you'll fish 8, sometimes you'll fish 12, sometimes you'll fish 15, but as a rule of thumb, 10 pounds. That's a heavy sash weight, costs about 50 bucks. You don't want to lose them. Okay, so I've got it rigged, as you can see, on about 3 feet of 80-pound test. On the end of it is a small swivel right there, just a small snap swivel. I pop open that snap, and you can use a swivel like this. You can use a long line clip that we use sometimes, and I'll snap it right to that loop, which you're about to see me do, okay? 150 feet away from the bait. So right now, boat is moving north. I'm standing in the back of the boat. My leader is stretched out behind the boat. My bait is 150 feet back there right now, still on the surface because I haven't put any lead on it yet, right? Okay, I've just clipped my lead on and this is not a breakaway sinker. We do not want this to break away. We fight the fish the entire time until it's up to the lead, okay? We don't want this to come off. So now imagine you are hooked into a swordfish that could be anywhere from 50 to 500 pounds. He's 150 feet away from this lead. 
okay? That long leader, he's 150 feet away from this lead. And this lead is 2,500 feet, nearly a half a mile away from me. There's a lot going on there, an awful lot going on there. And if one thing is wrong, it will fail. The entire system will fail. So at this stage, I'm putting my lead on. We are still heading to the north, okay? There's the loop. Like I said, right there, it's just below where the wind-on connects to the braid. Boom, I clip on my sinker. Big long line clip, very carefully. I lift it over the side, ease it down, keep my hand on the spool. I'm looking right at that digital readout. Again, you can see how big the buttons are in the readout, so it's very easy to see. And see where it says right now, I'm not sure if you can see that, but it says 158. Why does it say 158? Because my leader was 150 feet long and I'm just past it. So it's a great indication as to exactly what's going on. And now I let that baby rip. I just let it fall, free spool. As the boat is going to the north, I am letting that fall as fast as it can go. I keep my hand on it. I'm letting it go as fast as it will go as he's continuing to move to the north. But what I'm doing is every we'll say three or 400 feet, I grab the spool and I stop. And I hold the spool. Because now as the boat is moving to the north, all my line is coming off my reel. I grab that spool and now it tightens. It spreads out. You with me? It stretches out. So the bait stays way back there. Then there's the sinker, and now here's the line coming up to the boat. I stretch it out. Every three or 400 feet, I'll hold it for like five seconds. That's all you have to do because you're moving really fast. And once you'll feel it, once it's really tight, let out another three or four hundred feet. After you get to, you know, say seven, eight hundred feet, hold it tight. Okay, you can either pop up, you know, tighten up the drag or just grab the side of the spool. And I'll consistently do that until I'm at about sixteen hundred feet. Sixteen hundred revolutions on the reel. At that point, Okay, at that point, we are still moving north. I'm back here in the corner. I've let out 1,600 feet of line. I'm not on the bottom yet, and the boat is still moving to the north. Remember that, the boat's still moving to the north. At that point, I will tell the wheelman, start to turn the boat. He's right here, he's facing north, and he will start to make a big 180. Right here, he'll, make, he'll just turn the boat, and now he's going to be facing south. And at that stage, I go right back into free spool. And I drop that bait all the way to the bottom. All the way to the bottom. I just open that reel up, keep my hand right on there, drop that bait all the way to the bottom. And keep in mind, even though you're in 16 or 1,700 feet of water, that will not read 1,700 feet. Because remember, there's a giant bow in the line. It may read 2,300 or 2,400 before it hits. And you got to pay attention here because line is flying off the reel at this stage, flying off the reel, and it's only going to contact the bottom. It's going to go boom and stop, and then in two seconds, it's going to come flying off the reel again. So if you're not paying attention to when it hit the bottom right there, you may miss it. You literally may miss it. So as soon as it hits the bottom, I lock it up, and now what I do is I retrieve some line and I'm bringing line back up off the bottom because now the boat is no longer facing north. He's now made a 180 and he's facing south. And I am right here on the side of the boat. We fish our swordfish rod out of the same rod holder every time. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's fished right there out of the same rod holder. He's right here on the wheel and I'm standing right here. I'm looking at my Furuno machines. I could see the bottom, I could see the chart plotter, and he can see the rod. And more importantly, he can see the line coming off the rod. So he's right here on my 37 CV like this, and I'm right here like this. We work together as a team. Ideally, I want my line to be right here next to the boat, knowing that it's not straight down right there. It's way away from there. It could be way over there, or it could be way over there, depending on where we are in my drift, okay? But I'm gonna fish right here. He's going to hold that wheel. For whoever's taking notes, write down these numbers. 180 to 210. 
180 to 210. That is the compass heading that the guy on the wheel has to be at the entire time while you are drifting. 180 degrees to 210 degrees. That is where that bow is pointed in that small little window. Remember now the current is pushing us to the north, right? Everybody with me? We're facing into the current. The boat is still in gear. We maintain movement. The boat remains in gear. It never comes out of gear. So he is taking that boat and running into the current at 180 to 200 degrees. I'm fishing right off the side right here. As he is motoring, and sometimes we'll pop one engine in gear and leave, you know, we'll only run on one motor, sometimes all three motors, sometimes two of the three, depends on how fast the current is. But we want to slow our drift. We're not going to stop our drift. Even though you're standing in the boat and you're moving this way, guess which way you're moving? This way. Okay, it's really, really odd if you've never been out there. You know, you think you're going this way, but everything is moving this way. Okay, and what we're trying to do is slow that movement to the north. So your boat has to remain in gear between 180 and 210. The line is right there. I have retrieved the line. I want to bring this lead 50 to 200 feet off the bottom. 50 to 200 feet off the bottom is where I want this lead. Knowing that the leader is 150 feet long. It is fluttering like this. That swordfish is down on the bottom. He will lay right on the bottom and sometimes he'll swim up 500 feet off the bottom and everywhere in between. So oftentimes, We'll fish, we'll have that bait 50 feet off the bottom, I'll reel up 50 feet. Wait five minutes, reel up 50 feet. Wait five minutes, drop it down 75 feet. In other words, we'll move it through the water column. We'll lift it up, we'll drop it back down. If at any time, and this will happen, we'll say, where's the bottom? Where's the bottom? Okay, well, hold on. I pop it in the free spool, I drop the lead fast as it can go, all the way in the free spool. Boom, it hit the bottom, I zero it out. I, well, I don't zero out the reel, but I'm zeroing out in my head knowing, okay, I just hit the bottom, now I retrieve 50 feet or 100 feet. You wanna keep that bait within 200, 300 feet at the most of the bottom. You want it as close to the bottom as you can possibly get it. Again, knowing that I've got a 150 foot leader fluttering right there. So here it is in this particular scenario, um, still in the back, I let out the line, as I mentioned, I'm doing exactly you know, what I said I was doing, just letting it out every now and then. I thumb that spool, I slow it down, and now you will see Carlos is slowly starting to see the boat turning to 180. He's slowly starting to turn around. Okay, I'm free spooling it. He's staying between 180. You can see the, well, kind of hard to see the line there, but trying to keep that line right next to the boat right there until he gets that boat in the perfect position and my line is now right here. It's right here. Now why is this so important? Remember we are drifting to the north. He's got to have the bow pointed right here in order for me to have my line right here. If he points the bow this way, look where my line is. Whoop, the boat runs right over my line. You guys see that? So again, a small little mistake. He goes this way, the boat drifts right over the line. So it's very important. Now he can turn the boat more this way, but then my line goes like this. And now the boat's drifting broad to the current, even too fast. So he's got to stay in that window. And you almost have to look at it as one unit. And I have to stress this. I have to stress this because it's really, really important. When you are sword fishing, daytime sword fishing, and you're fishing with this rod out of the rod holder, everything is one cohesive unit. Everything. The boat the rod, the line, you have to understand that it's not you with the rod under your arm fighting that fish, it's the boat. It's every, every movement that the boat does is affecting and reacting to what's happening on the rod. And this really becomes important when you're fighting a fish into what we're about to get into. It's all one cohesive unit. Why is that so important? 
What if you're hooked into a 300 pound fish, the fish is peeling off line, okay, and suddenly he guns the boat. You just increased all of that tension between the fish and the boat and pop, you pop them off. You pulled the hook, busted a leader, who knows? Okay, so you need to remember that it's one cohesive unit. So now he's got the bow pointed 180 to 210. My bait's right here, I'm looking at that line. It's anywhere from 50 to 200 feet off the, off the bottom. I'm drifting in approximately, we'll say 1,700 feet of water. And now what I like, one of the most exciting things about sword fishing, which a lot of people think are the most boring things about sword fishing, is looking at that rod tip, okay? Okay, but you will, ha you will see that once this is bouncing off the bottom, this rod tip will fall into a pattern, and it'll go like this, just like this. As the boat's coming up and down, that rod tip is moving, just like this, okay? And you can see it there, obviously, just moving up and down. Now, what you are looking for, do not be under the impression that you're looking for this savage bite where that rod's just going to whoo and just bend double over right to the water. And you go, oh, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. No, not going to happen. Okay, remember what's going on here. You've got 2,500 feet of line out. You have a giant bow in the line. That line is going to a 10-pound lead. Off that 10-pound lead, you have a 150-foot leader. And a fish just grabbed your bait or whacked your bait. To see that bite translated through all of that, a massive strike may only look like this. A massive strike. You may see that rod tip and the rhythm is going like this. Just nice and steady rhythm and doop and back to the rhythm. That's it. You just had a bite. Fish just ate it right there, or he whacked it, or he swam up to it. Something happened. Something changed. The rhythm changed. It went from like this, or then it'll go, and back. Okay, and you guys that have been sword fishing, daytime sword fishing, know exactly what I mean. That's a super exciting moment, because right there, you got a bite. You know something is going on. Something is happening. But unfortunately, you don't know what it is. You don't know at that point if you have a 300-pound fish that grabbed your bait, inhaled it, and he's hooked. Or if you've got a 50-pounder just whacking it. Or you've got a 550-pounder that just swam up next to it. You don't know. So you have to react. You have to react quickly based on what's happening. Keep the boat doing exactly what the boat is doing. Do not change the guy at the wheel. Don't do anything different. Okay, I tell him, just do exactly what you're doing. Don't do anything different. I'm going to do it from here. So what I do then is I pop it in the free spool, and I drop that lead 50 feet, and I stop, and I wait. And then you'll look at that rod tip, and the same thing will be happening. You'll see that rhythm, and then it'll go doo -doo, like that. That's it. Okay, he, hit, he either hit it again or he's got it. Then what I'll do is I'll crank the drag up and whoo, I'll put the reel in gear and I'll wind up 100 feet. And I'll look right at that rod tip right there. And as it's retrieving, if the rod tip goes, loads up. That's what we call that. We call it when the rod tip loads up. Oh my God, that's so exciting. When the rod tip loads up, you guys that have been sword and know what I'm talking about, right? You know, you hit that power button and suddenly that rod tip just loads like that, okay? You got them. You're hooked up right there. Now, at that particular moment, you need again to react appropriately because you don't want to lose that fish. You're tight. You're hooked up to that fish. You know you got them on, okay? So now you've got to back off a little bit on the drag and you have to react appropriately. Different fish react differently based on their size, depending on what's happening. Sometimes these fish are very stubborn and they don't even want to come up off the bottom. Your rod's loaded up, okay? You still have 2,500 feet of line out between you and the fish. You've got the reel in gear. The reel is retrieving. Very, very important, the amount of drag that you are applying at this point. A lot of guys will lose fish because they're applying way too much drag. Think about this for one second. Think about if you had this attached 
this 10 pound lead to 2,500 feet of braid going back up to a boat with a fish on the other end and you tried to pull at sort of through the water. You know how much drag is on that line? Tremendous amount of drag. Go light, light. Don't, don't plow that thing down. Go light, really light, because there's already so much drag on that line that's already happening. There's already that giant bow of line in the water. So there's so much drag being applied to that fish before you even do anything. He's pulling a sinker around. The boat's moving. He's got a 37-foot CB pulling him around. Okay, a lot of drag. So go light on the drag. What's happening now, the fish has got the hook, hopefully stuck down his throat, sometimes wrapped around his bill, sometimes hooked in his dorsal. You never know. Okay, you don't know. Sometimes hooked right here, real soft spot, and will rip right out. So you really have to baby him. You don't know where you're at in the whole ordeal yet. Keep the boat doing what the boat is doing. Start retrieving line. The fish now is going to slowly start to come up. The tension on the line, nine out of ten times, is going to cause that fish to slowly come up what we call like a glide path. The boat is still moving to the north. It's facing south, slowly moving to the north. You just hooked up. The boat's still drifting, and slowly that fish is going to start to plane, start to come up off the bottom. At this stage, the guy on the wheel is going to start to turn to the left and he's gonna to start to make big circles around the fish, big circles, because happens every time, okay? He's gonna to start to make big circles. So when you're out there sword fishing, if you see a boat going in circles like this, you know what it means? He's hooked up, that's it, he's hooked up. The only reason in the world he's going in circles is because he's hooked up, reeling in a fish. So slowly the boat's gonna start going in circles. You're bringing that fish up, up, up. It's loading up more and more. The fish has no idea what's going on yet. He's in a state of shock. He's not even in shock. He's sitting there swimming around going, yo, what's up? What's going on? He has no idea what is going on. All he knows is slowly he's being persuaded toward the surface. And as he rises toward the surface, the water temperature starts to warm up because he's used to being in ice cold 40 degree water. Suddenly, he's not 2,000 feet down, now he's 1,000 feet below the surface. The water's starting to warm up, starting to see a little bit of light, he's starting to panic a little bit. He's starting to go, wait a minute, what the hell's going on here? Something's not right, okay? And as that continues, as that fish gets closer to the surface, it starts to react, okay? It starts to react. And the closer it'll get to the surface, the more it will react. And oftentimes, you'll go completely slack. Slack. Why? Because he's pulling your lead up. He's swimming up and pulling that lead up. So you're slack and you're going, oh my God, I lost him. I lost everything. No, you didn't. He's pulling your lead up toward the surface. Crank as fast as you can. Get that reel just going and going and going. He's coming up and he may very well jump. Anyone who thinks swordfish don't jump are sadly mistaken. These fish will clear the water like a blue marlin. Okay, they will jump way out of the water. Anyhow, that fish will come up toward the surface. The fight has not begun yet. You're just warming up. At that stage, it is really important that you handle your equipment properly. And one reason that I really like this Linger and Pittman S1200 because of the big level wind. You're paying attention to so many different things. I'm paying attention to the machines. I'm paying attention to the tip of the rod because that's telling me everything. The position of that rod tip is telling me everything. How much heat I'm putting on the fish, what he's doing, is he coming up toward the surface? Is he digging back down toward the bottom? The rod tip tells the whole story. The last thing I want to be doing is looking down at the reel, trying to put my line on the reel evenly because it doesn't have a level wind, okay? That could be a nightmare. So that's another reason that I like this reel because of that big level wind. I don't have to worry about what's happening here. All I have to worry about is what's happening here. That's what's important to me. So the fish is coming up now. And finally, after what could be 30 minutes or four hours and 30 minutes, eventually you will get to this point. 
You will get to the lead, which is still on the line. Remember, this is not a breakaway. This is one of the most crucial parts of the whole fight is getting the lead off because you don't want to have any slack in that line. You know, we've had fish. There's an episode that was playing on here before we started the seminar. We had a really, really nice fish, fought him, had him right up next to the boat. Man, he was right there. I'm grabbing the harpoon and the thing goes, Toop, and just spits the hook. Right there, the hook just goes, Toop, just falls out like it wasn't even in there. Like he was just mouthing it between his teeth. You don't know when that hook is going to come out. So the last thing that you want to do is have any slack line whatsoever at any point. So as that lead is coming up, it's usually a team effort. Maybe whole, you know, my other guy will reach down and grab the lead and unsnap it as quickly as possible. Maybe I will, but the point is you need to get this off as quickly as you can in one swift motion. Just click, unclip it off the swivel, throw this in the boat. I'm done with the lead. Now the fight begins. Now the fight is on. Up until this point, you were fighting a lead. You were fighting a 10-pound sinker and you had a 150-foot leader with a fish that could be 50 or 500 pounds. You don't even know yet because you haven't seen them. You know it's a nice fish. Now when I take that lead off, if I can get on to the wind-on, how strong was this? 250. Now we're going to put some heat on the fish. Remember we were fishing 60, 70, 80-pound braid really light, and I said, man, how do you catch a really big fish on light braid? That's because all we were doing is just slowly bringing them up, okay? The fight really didn't begin yet. Once we get on the wind on is when that fight starts. That fish is only 150 feet away from the boat. He's extended out from the rod tip. The guy at the wheel is going in big circles because you know what that fish is doing? He is aiming right for the outboard engines. Every time. I am not kidding you. These fish are not stupid. They did not get big by being dumb. They see those outboard engines. They see all of that white water. And to them, they don't know what it is, but they know that that might be freedom. Okay, so they are constantly swimming toward that commotion, toward those propellers. So he's constantly keeping that boat going in a big circle as that fish is coming right toward those outboard engines. And now we see him. It's a nice fish. 175, 200 pounds, whatever, like this. Okay, nice fish. He's up on top. He's over there. He jumped one time. Man, are we excited. But you know what? It's far from over because he's still not in the boat. And until that fish is in the boat, he could still escape. So everything at this moment has to happen flawlessly. Your guy behind the wheel has to be working with the guy on the rod because remember now I've applied the heat. Now I want to end this. I want to kill this fish. I want to bring him home. Okay, so I put on more drag because now I've got the leader, the 250-pound the test wind on, on the spool. I'm not fishing that little 80-pound braid. So I put the heat on. He's on the wheel. If he moves that boat too fast, what's going to happen? Pop. We're going to pop the fish right off. So you're constantly communicating. Okay, or let me rephrase that. I'm constantly yelling. Okay, they say I yell a little bit, all right? I don't think so, but they tell me I'm yelling a little bit, okay? So in turn, you've got to work together as a team to really put an end to this fight. He's moving the boat. The fish, with every revolution, is getting closer and closer and closer. And don't rush it. Don't rush it. A couple inches at a time. If you can only get a couple inches at a time on that reel, then that's all that you can get. Okay, don't sit there and try and, you know, and wind them in like crazy. A little bit at a time. Get whatever that you can get until that fish is within harpoon range. Okay, within harpoon range. Now, again, the reason I say harpoon range, a 200-pound swordfish is not going to swim up next to the boat and go, kill me. Go ahead. You got me. Kill me. Not going to happen. He's constantly going to be going toward those, toward those motors. He's full of energy. He's alive. He's pissed. He is really, really mad. So we know that it's very unlikely that we're going to be able to pull that fish right up next to the boat and be able to just reach down and gaff him. Just not going to happen. So when he's within harpoon range, 
we whip out our harpoon. Anybody ever throw a harpoon before? Okay, let me explain to you how this works. It's like a javelin. It's heavy. This is weighted up here, okay? Has a sharp dart, as you can see, right up at the top there. That dart is connected via this cable line. It is lightly taped to this harpoon pole. Goes all the way down, right to this line, lightly taped again. Try not to harpoon you. And at the bottom of the bar is a loop where the rope goes through, okay, where the rope goes through. Now, what you don't see is I've got a basket with 1,500 feet of line going to a poly ball right up on top. So I can take that ball, I immediately throw it out of the basket because I don't want that to tangle. That ball is in the boat. It's not out in the water. I grab my harpoon, and now a lot's going on. There's a lot of screaming. The fish is right there. And now you've got to aim. Don't worry, I'm not going to throw it at you. You've got to aim, and you have to chuck that sucker like you mean it. Okay, and you have to throw that thing through the air and into that fish. And if you miss, because people miss, you pull it back in the boat very quickly and you do it again until you hit them. And when you do hit them, what happens is the weight of this harpoon will penetrate that swordfish and this dart will go through, usually right through the entire fish. The weight of the pole will bend, the dart will come off and the pole will be dangling right on the line. So you don't lose the pole, okay? The pole is always attached to the line. But once this dart is in the fish, it's usually off, off of the harpoon. At that stage, at that stage, the fight is still not over. Because even though you have a harpoon in them, you're now only connected to that fish with this little rope. And you don't know where you got it. You may not have seen the shot. You don't know if it's just barely in them or all the way through them. So again, you're closer to putting an end to the battle, but you're not there yet. You grab your harpoon line. Nine out of 10 times, you stick that fish with that harpoon. What's he doing? Swimming away. He's not going, all right, hey, you got me. Okay, he's right back down. And sometimes they will pull out hundreds, hundreds of feet of line. And you may have to ultimately throw that buoy off the boat. Just get it out there in the water. And now their buoy's way out there. You're still connected to the fish here, and he's connected to that buoy line. And a lot could go wrong there because you've got a big distance of line. So a lot of different things are happening and you have to get to your poly ball. You have to get to your poly ball as quickly as you can and retrieve it, okay? Because obviously you don't want this floating around out there. Now the fish is coming closer to the boat. The fight is almost over. And at this point, you can either stick him with a regular gaff if he's done, or sometimes a flying gaff, which is similar to a harpoon. You stick a big hook in the fish, and it's connected via rope right to the boat. The fish is laying next to the boat. Take a deep breath, but it's not over yet. That fish is still not done. He's thrashing like this. <laughs> and you better be careful. Because that right there, if it hits you, will potentially kill you. It really will. So you really have to be careful. Leather gloves, okay? We carry different kinds of gloves. When we're fighting the fish on the reel, I use these soft little gloves. Why? Because this harsh leather on really tight braid could break the braid. So we don't fish these harsh leather gloves. We fish these soft little cotton ones when we're fighting the fish. However, when the fish is next to the boat and we're ready to put them in the boat, we use the leather gloves because you grab that sharp bill with these and it'll just rip your hands apart completely. So you've got to have the right tools. So in turn, the fish is next to the boat. Don't be in a hurry to get them in the boat. If it's a big fish, put a tail rope around them, secure them to the boat, take a deep breath, and start celebrating, because that's victory right there, okay? And only, only if everything was right and all of your connections were perfect and the fish gods were shining down on you that day, will you be successful in daytime sword fishing. Anything less than that, and you will fail.
and it will be an extremely frustrating experience. It's a science. It's a science that requires specialized tackle. It's a science that requires a specialized mindset and a team effort. There are guys that go out there and swordfish, daytime swordfish by themselves and are really, really successful. I don't know how they do it. I wouldn't do it. Okay, but I got a buddy that goes out here, does it all the time. He's caught 500 pound fish by himself. Can't put him in the boat. He calls other people out there to help him put him in the boat. But he'll go out there, he'll do it all. Because remember, this reel is on the entire time. You just have it on, and you're fighting the fish with the drag right here. Okay, you don't have to turn the reel off. Okay, so it's all because of the equipment, how you have everything stationed, how your boat is set up. There's so much to it. But I got to tell you, when you achieve success and you actually come home with that fish lying on the deck of your boat, I don't care how big it is, as long as it's a keeper, 54 inches, as long as it's a keeper, you did it because you can't determine what size fish eats your bait. You can't do it. So it's all about the accomplishment. It's all about, I went out there with the right mindset. I went to the right place. I did the right thing with the right gear, and boom, it paid off. Okay, it paid off. That's daytime sword fishing.